Hallelujah. Maxine, did you ever sing in the youth choir? I ain't think so. You always ran away from choir rehearsal. I sung in the youth choir. Yeah, I did. Sometime when I showed up. Thank you. And then my youth, what a blessing. Thank you, Keith. I told them a couple of Sundays ago, I got an outing this summer. I'm going to take them. They're going to be my guests. I told them they got to be right and ready, though, so they got to work out. So they're working out so I can take them with me at one of the big anniversary services in town. We're excited today, and uh, I'm glad to see you. Most, you know, I really am. I know it's rough for most people to show up two Sundays in a row, but <laughs> it's really good to see you this morning. And, uh, and I know we got a big, big, big week this week. A lot of you are at home because you're going to be here Tuesday night. And uh, Tuesday night, I, I need you here. Now, a lot of times I say this and you just let it. Uh, Tuesday night is our opening worship service. It's really our only evening worship service for IC3. We have over 1,100 people that are coming to your church. Uh, to worship with you and they want they want to see you and um, and I'm serious so and then and then that service will be live broadcast on the word network so word network is coming to town they want to broadcast the, the whole service on Tuesday night and you wouldn't want to be at home saying well I'm not going to come going to look at it on television then they flash the congregation. And the only people here are the people who have flown here from a long way. Uh, so I know, I know you'll be here. So you see the urgency of why we're here. We're delighted this morning to have guests on our campus. And they didn't come too far to be with us. They came from Cape Town, South Africa. We have a delegation of them that are worshiping with us, not just this day, but they came for the whole week because they wanted to see how you do church. Never know. The scripture says, be careful how you entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unaware. We have with us from the Destined for Greatness Church from Cape Town, South Africa, one of my friends now, the Reverend Mr. Tondo Milani, and he's going to preach for us this morning. And I know you're like me. You wouldn't want anybody to come all the way from South Africa to worship here. And this is not his first time with us. Uh, Tondo was with us last year. And then we have Pastor Z will be here at the 10 o'clock service and others. And so I want to thank you for being such a warm and winsome and loving congregation. Now this morning my heart's real heavy. Some of you have probably gotten word. One of our young and long-term members, she's been with me when we had fold-up chairs on Bingo Road. She never complained when, when, when Hurricane Harvey shut our campuses down. Uh, I don't know if you know this, we had a lot of members left our church and relocated to other churches because they were mad that we didn't open the church up soon enough. We could have if they had given some money, but that's another subject. Uh, but that's the truth. I, I later found out that they, they were upset that we didn't open up fast enough. By the way, you should thank God that you have a church that has enough integrity that wouldn't put you in harm's way. Um, we can't open a building if the city code doesn't allow you to do that. For those of you that don't know that, that's breaking the law. And, uh, and it's for some reason, churches feel like they can break the law. Uh, I'm talking about the law of the land and go away without, well, I'm not, I, I love all y'all, but I ain't going to jail for none of you. I, I, I love you. I'm, I'm serious about that. 
and, um, and, and, and uh, 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 Lena has been a part of this church uh, for forever. And her son now, and we got to pray for CJ and really undergird him and cover him, believe in prayer. You don't have to know who they are. Um, she actually volunteered this week for IC3 and had been in all of the meetings and yesterday was killed in an automobile accident on her way uh, to meet friends. And so I want you to lift her up in prayer, that whole family. Her brother Keith was one of our faithful, faithful men at Bingo who parked cars. We buried him last year. And so that family has been struck with tragedy and we want to undergird them. And I know you will in prayer and cover them because uh, it's a heavy load today. And uh, you see, as a pastor, after a while, you know, when you don't know people, you, you bury members. But when you've been around a while and get involved, you move from member to family. And so our family circle has been broken. And so I want us to pray for each other and pray for that family. And you'll hear more about uh, the services, but undergird a son Really, really ask God to lift him up, to give him strength uh, to endure right now in her whole family, all right? I know you will. Okay, the praise team uh, is singing today because I know you don't need explanation, but I know some of my members, they think that the choir has defected after Easter. <laughs> no, they, they got to work hard on Tuesday night. So I tell them when you got to work like that over time, you know, so the, the, this group right here, though, <laughs> the Motley Crew, all right. Come on, y'all, bless us this morning. Enjoy yourself. Don't rush it. Come on, let's give God praise, and then let's pray for Pastor Tondo Milani. Let him know we're glad to have him on our camp.
You may be seated. Let me take this time and greet uh, Pastor Ralph West, whom I love so much, or we love so much. Um, and uh, Mrs. West, in her absence, um, we love them so much. The man is living my dream, and so I love him so much. And my sister from my other mother, Joel London. Bless the Lord. I'm with my wife here. Her name is Mamiki. She's wonderfully and fearfully made the wife of my youth. We met at university, and so I had two junior degrees when I left university, uh, the academic one and my wife. So we bless the Lord for this time and we thank him for this time for he is worthy to be praised. Can we pray? Can we bow our heads and pray? Father, thank you for this time. You are worthy to receive glory and honor. You are in this place here with the power to heal and the grace to forgive. Here with the perception to give and an action to do. We bless you and we give you all honor and glory and everybody shall say, my sermon this morning is like what one pastor said, uh, given that I come from Africa, in Africa we preach for two hours and above. But because I'm in America with my brothers and sisters who are so much colonized that they give me a few minutes. Um, so my message this morning is going to be like a mini skirt. Long enough to cover the basics and short enough to attract attention. (laughs) 
The caption of my sermon this morning is making home in the house and in the family. Making home in the house and in the family. I've, we are blessed with two children and the eldest is called, that's how Americanized I am, the eldest is called Tando Jr., in which you don't find that in Africa, you only find it in America, but, but because I'm so Americanized, I decided that I should have Tando Jr. The word Tando, it's my venec, which means love. So I wanted the legacy of love to continue in the family. His name is Tando Jr. So when he was doing grade one, the teacher had been teaching them subtraction. And she wanted to test her lessons. Um, and then she zeroes into TJ and she says to TJ, TJ, I have 100 apples and I give you 30. How many do I have remaining? And TJ says, 100. And the teacher says, TJ, I have 100 apples. I give you 30. How many that are remaining? How many that are remaining? And TJ says, 100. And the teacher is getting warmed up a little bit. She says, TJ, I've got 100 apples and I give you 30. How many do I have remaining? And TJ says, I told you. 100. And she says, why TJ? TJ says, who told you that I'm going to give you my apples? Or I'm going to take your apples rather. Who told you that I'm going to take your apples? You see, we live in assumptions. And sometimes assumptions, they land us into deep problems and into deep trouble. We have a tendency to think that a house is a home. We've got a tendency to think that a family is a home. You see, a house is a structure. A family is a form of identification, especially for us as Africans. You see, if an elderly African person asks you, they don't ask you who you are, they ask you, in which homestead are you coming from? They are not concerned about you, they are concerned about your home. And so, the first and the oldest, the oldest psalm in the book of Psalms is not Psalm number one, it's Psalm 90. And because Psalm 90 is the prayer that Moses gave after he was disappointed. And so he writes Psalm 90, which is a prayer. And so, this prayer is practically in twofold. It is in twofold in this sense because verse 1 and 2 and 3, it gives a definition of who God is. Then from verse 4, 5 to 10, it tells us about who we are as human beings. And verse 11 to verse 17 makes a transition and it shows us how do we live to the definition of God. Mind you, it takes three verses to define who God is, and it takes eight to define who humanity is, because God does not have a problem of who he is. We have a problem of who we are. Making home in our houses and in our families. And so I'm just, just going to read verse 1. So verse 1 says... The prayer of Moses, the man of God, Lord, you've been our dwelling place through all generations. Yes, the Hebrew understanding and the Hebrew interpretation of that word is the dwelling place, the place which we call home. It's amazing that Moses does not say you are our home. He says you have been our home before the mountains were there uh, it's a past continuous tense so in other words before everything that was God has been a home 
So everyone who has been born on planet Earth came into a home. Now, if you've got an understanding that God is home, and I want to give you four things that shows that God is a home and defines what a home should be. Four things that are going to define who God is and defines what home should be. Number one, if we read the Bible in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4, it says, For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. So in other words, the concept of home does not start with sociologists. The concept of home starts with God. And Moses says, let everyone who lives on planet earth knows this. The concept of home starts with God and it ends with God. When sociologists study the social beings, they are studying what has been there already. It has already been there by God but because... It is God who builds everything. Now, let's define what home is. If a family and a house is home, it must have this first thing. It must be a place of safety. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 33 says, The Lord's, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked but he blesses the home of the righteous. How does he bless the home of a righteous? Because home must reflect who God is. That's the reason God blesses home. Must reflect who God is and a home must be a place of safety. By safety we mean this, home must be a place where you are able to be naked but not be ashamed. Home must be a place where there's safety, where there are no secrets. It can be a family, it can be a house that keeps secrets. But it can't be a home because when it is home, everyone must be at ease and everyone must be himself or herself with safety. I'm talking about a righteous home. It, it, you can't stay for 33 years hiding a secret. It can be that is not a home. You've got families who have been hiding things for many years. They have not made home. Houston is filled of houses and families, but it is, there are few homes. And so home must be a place of safety. Home must be a place where I'm able to state what I feel, even if I'm clearly wrong. Place of safety. Is your home a place of safety? I'm not talking about your house. You can get all alarms. You can get everything, but is it your place, a place of safety? It breaks my heart in Christian homes where people are not themselves. You know what happened when Satan tempted Adam and Eve to move away from home. He tempted them, and when he tempted them, when they got into sin, the Bible says they did not hide. It says they hid from each other. So in other words, another person was seeing the nakedness of another person and instead of hiding himself or herself, was hiding from another person. Where there is no home, there are secrets. Number two, if a house or a family is a home, 
It must be a place of repose. Put it into young people's language. It must be a place of chillaxing. We must get so many chilling pills that everyone is at ease. This is what the book of Isaiah 32 verse 18 says. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, in a sure dwellings and in quiet. See, one of the things that God is speaking to you here is stop bringing work home. There can be serenity, there can be quietness if there's no attention. We pass each other out of business. And when we get in there, we are alone with no one. Fight for the space to keep serenity at home. Yeah. Fight for that space. That's home. It must be a place where if the world beats me, I can go home and get peace. It must be a place of peace. Endeavor to build a home. And number three, it must be a place of affirmation. It must be a place of affirmation. John 6, the verse that is popular, 663 says, The spirit gives life, and the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are full of spirit and life. Proverbs 25 verse 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. I learned some time ago that there are four levels of communication. The first level of communication is casual. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? The second level of communication is formal business. Do we have money for this month? Where are we going for holiday? Do we have money for school for children? Do our insurance is covered and everything like that? Have you ever noticed that whenever we call a family meeting, it's about business? So the first level will be casual. Second level is business. Third level is dealing with challenges. No family that does not have challenges. In fact, if you are in a family that does not have challenges, you are in a wrong family. Find another one because it's not normal. And so, so these three levels, the casual and the business and the challenges which we must deal with. Do you know that as families, we can spend all of our time of knowing each other, communicating on these three levels? Do you, you, you know that the statistics show that couples, married couples, spend four minutes talking daily? Because we operate on the, these three levels, and you would notice this about these three levels, they are always reactive. And so people can be married for 30 years, and that would be seen. I have a friend of mine who has been married for 30 years. And when his children, or when their children at 25 left their house, when it was an empty nest, they started to have serious problems with each other. Why? Because they learned all the 25 years to operate on these three levels. They communicate on these three levels. And so I want to teach you today a level four of communication, which I regard as the highest, is called having life-giving conversations. Life-giving conversations. How are life-giving conversations? You see, life-giving conversations are not reactive. They are proactive. As Stephen Covey in Time Management puts it, it's a quadrant one time management. It's not urgent, but it's important. 
So in other words, you must make time to talk to your wife and to listen. You make time. You make time to speak life to your children. You make time to speak life to your siblings. No, 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 no. If, if you're a married couple here, I can ask you, when last did your wife or your husband tell you that I love you? Don't worry. You see, if it's going to be a home, it must be full of life-giving conversations. And life-giving conversations, you make time for them. You speak words, you speak actions on daily basis. You take your children and speak life to them. And the problem is, is that you have never done, and most of the time we do it less or some of us don't do it at all. You see, God has created all of us to have an emotional bank. And whenever you want to take out when you have not deposited, you get a reaction that is going to be negative. Listen, in the seven churches, we, we're going to talk about it. We, we're going to finish about that with that. But, but in the seven churches of the book of Revelation, you, you see there's something that I'm going to talk about. That, but it's life-giving. Be quick to affirm. Be slow to criticize. Life-giving, life-giving conversations. And some of us here, God is speaking with you now to go and ask for forgiveness. And some of you now, you've got to go and say, you know what? I love you. You should have heard of a story of a man who was working with his colleague, sharing an office next to his desk. And he saw this guy that, this guy, man, 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 he was so impressed. This guy once a week will buy flowers or buy, or buy something else for his wife. And after some, quite a long time, this guy thought, let me copy this and go and do it with my wife. And so he asked this guy, look, I've not been having life-giving conversations. How, how do I start this? And this guy says, what does your wife like? And so he named a lot of them. And, and after some time, he said, okay, I'll only do three of them. So he bought earrings and chocolate and flowers, took them home. And when he knocked, he knocked with his knee. And the wife came and opened. And when the wife looked at him, she cried. And the guy was like, what's wrong? The wife says, you know, I had a horrible day today at work. A horrible, my boss was just horrible today. And when I fetch your kids, they were worse than my boss. And now today, you are drunk. Because the wife has never experienced life-giving actions and life-giving conversations. You see, if we're going to build godly homes, if we're going to reflect who God is in our families, we must learn to do all we can to give life-giving conversations. Listen, probably it's time for you to call your whole family. And just tell them how much you love them. It's not going to be a business meeting. It's going to be how much I love you. And probably you've got to get into a culture where you affirm and stop criticizing. You see, criticizing comes naturally. Affirming comes supernaturally. You need to affirm. All that our children need, all that our spouses need, all that our siblings need is to tell them, have life-giving conversation. And sometimes life-giving conversations have got to do with listening. So number one, it must be a place of safety. Number two, it must be a place where we repose. Number three, it must be a place where we affirm life-giving conversations. And number four, it must be a place of discipline. Something that has disappeared 
in our time. But listen, discipline without love leads to rebellion. And so this is what you find in the seven churches of the book of Revelation, is the concept that I've named it a sandwich. So a sandwich goes this way, you affirm, you critique, you affirm. Let's repeat it. You affirm, you critique, you affirm. So in seven churches, God will say, you have this thing that is good about yourself, but I've got this thing against you, but you can make it better. So whenever you discipline, start with affirming and criticize, and so, and affirm again, I know you can do this thing. When you are disciplining without a sandwich approach, you miss the person. And so if it's going to be a family, we must have hard conversations. But those hard conversations must be underguarded by a strong sense of love. It is wrong, you can correct it. And one of the things that a, how a family will remain a family and not a home if it does not have grace. Amen. Let me conclude. In my own family, we are five siblings. Two of them have passed on. I'm the third born with my mother. I'm the first born with my dad. When my mother got married, to my dad, she already had two children from different fathers. And now I understand that my mother lost her parents when she was five or six years in a farm. And when her parents passed away, the white men chased them away as siblings. And so my mother went and lived in different families. And you can see a girl who lives in different families, what is, is going to happen after that? And so by the time my mother got married to my father, she already had two children on different fathers. And so in 1982, my mother and my father divorced. And we understand now when people divorce, they, they have another poetry, not the poetry we know. I can, I can remember clearly that when my mother and my father divorced, we went and stayed in a saloon. We stayed in a pub, behind a pub. We, we built a shack. You might not know that concept, but it's quite popular in South Africa. You build a shack behind a pub. We stayed there. I don't want to describe the environment in which we stayed in. And, and I can remember when I went to my father sometime looking for for him to buy things for me, he will have vulgar. I can remember saying, my, mother, my father saying to you, your mother is a she-dog. I can clearly remember my, my mother saying, your, 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 your dad is a dog, not like the hip-hop way. In my vernac, when you say someone is a dog, you literally mean that. And here I was, in 1982, I was 12 years old. 12 years old. In my early teenagehood, where I, I, I'm thinking to myself, if my mother is a shit dog and my dad is a dog, I must be a puppy. <laughs> Which made me to have a very low self-esteem. But in 1985, something awesome happened in my life. God sent a man who told me there's home for you. Yeah. Who told me that there's home for you in Jesus. Yeah. And not only told me that there's home for you, but, but I got home. And when I got home, in a situation which was not home, at 15 year old, was able to create home within that. You see, 
I'm the first one to go to university in my family. That might not be something strange with you. But what was strange about it is that I'm the third born at home. My two elder brothers, even today, trust me. There's nothing that is done at home without me, not because I'm better, because I found home. And when I went to my wife, when I proposed to my wife for marriage, I told her, I will never do you. I will never divorce you. In fact, I said to her, I will love you so much that it will become, I will make it difficult for you to divorce me. And my wife, her eyes opened, popped up. She said, what do you mean? And I said, I meant that. Where do I get that? I found home in Jesus. Your situation can change in Jesus. Jesus can make you home. He is able to turn a life of a teenager around and in an adverse situation makes a situation victorious because in Jesus you can find home. Please be seated. This one you need to hear it sitting. Does your house does your family reflect God? What is God saying to you today? God might be saying to you today, start a culture of affirming your wife or your husband. God is saying to you today, get into a culture where as, an, as a grandfather and a grandmother, you call your grandchildren and, and, and your grandchildren and begin to bless them. Life-giving conversation. You can't pass this life having not offered a blessing to your grandchildren and to your children. You must call a family meeting, not for business, but for doing that life-giving conversations. The government cannot do this for you. The church cannot do it for you. You need to reflect God in your family. Perhaps it's time for you to go and apologize. Perhaps it's time for you just to pick up a call and tell your sister, I love you. If God is going to be exalted, we must create home within our families. God is speaking with you. Do not harden your heart. God bless you.